I know sometimes Srila Guru Maharaj would say too, you know, in my mind and be touching his heart, like that mind and heart were synonymous. And on, on a very high level, we know when Mahaprabhu is before the Ratyatra chariot of, with Jagannath and Radha Baba Duti Subalita, he's enriched uh, with the heart and halo, the heart, <coughs> the heart of Srimati Radharani. When he starts singing different songs and verses, one of the ones that he sings, first of all, it's all sung from the perspective of Srimati Radharani. He's singing, but it's her heart expression. And one of the most famous says, Anyera Hridoyaman Moraman Brindavan. It says, normally, for most people, their heart and mind are the same. Anyera. For others, hridoy man. Hridoy meaning heart, man, mind. But she says, moraman, but my mind and Vrindavan are the same. Right. So, <clears throat> uh, here we're making uh, a distinction. Uh, how does it say? We're, we're, we're defining, connotating, we're increasing the connotation of what is meant by heart. Because uh, from a, uh, a mundane point of view, in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Bhumirapo anulobayu kamano bhutirevacha ahankara ityame bina prakritirashtadha. He outlines sequentially what are the eight material elements. Bhumirapo anulobayu, you know, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, and intelligence. And ahankara, uh, false ego. In the following sloka, it says, Apareya mitastanyam prakriti vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yayedam daryate jagat. He says that, but the jiva, jiva shakti, what I just outlined is the, uh, let me say, prakriti, uh, mundane energy. Jiva, is a superior uh, type of shakti, uh, which is above these eight elements. So, although we don't normally think of it this way, or it's not the first verse that would come to our mind in terms of Sahajiaism, Srila Guru Maharaj used it as a refutation of Sahajiaism along these lines, that their idea is that by reconditioning the element of mind, the mundane element of mind, filling it with images of Krishna, uh, making it accustomed to hearing certain sounds, that one will have some sort of epiphany and uh, their swarup will manifest. Guru Maharaj is of the opinion that all of this must dissolve, right? The, uh, because the subtlest aspect is the hunkar false ego, but then the booty, the mind, the body that's housing these elements, all of this must be uh, dissolved. In what way? Or Gurudev gave a famous lecture called Dissolving the Pillars of Ego, right? Demolishing the Pillars of Ego. How? not through some Buddhistic type of uh, dissolution, but rather through uh, 
service, through service engagement, through dedication. Right? Biological expression of the soul's delusion is the body. It's the outcome of jiva's uh, exploiting tendency, the desire to lord over matter. Sometimes he would quote uh, Robinson Crusoe, Alexander Selkirk, the famous, the man shipwrecked on the island, and he has a line where he says, I am the lord of all I survey. So he's saying, this mood, this mania, that I'm the master, and detesting the very notion of uh, uh, servitude, or uh, by extension, slavery, uh, uh, being subordinate, being submissive. In modern times, any qualities associated with this notion are considered undesirable and uh, detrimental to developing oneself, right? And one's self-esteem, etc. So the bi body is the biological expression of the soul's delusion, that includes mind, intelligence, but the outcome of exploiting tendency, the biological outcome of exploiting tendency, if we become connected to the service plane, if we withdraw from being exploiting agents and become enriched with a dedicating tendency, then the uh, body, mind, intelligence, which were the outcome of exploiting tendency, start to vanish, and the spiritual mind, uh, intellect, body, begin to manifest, the swarup. Srila Guru has mentioned uh, something in this regard to when Srila Saraswati Thakur and his disciples were um, on the Brajamandal Parikrama, circumambulating Vrindavan, and uh, when they came to one particular place, he employed what Gurumar is called Ruchi Pariksha, which means he was going to examine the taste, the spiritually acquired taste of his disciple. So he said to Srila Guru Maharaj, what is your favorite place? And Srila Guru Maharaj, at the time, he responded, Kadam Kandi, which is the place of Srila Rupa Goswami, uh, where he perhaps composed some of his works. His a special place of bhajan for Rupa Goswami and Vrindavan. So Guru Maharaj said, that place I, uh, has some special meaning to me and I have some special affinity for it. A few years went by and they're coming to Kadam Kandi again and Guru Maharaj said, Saraswati Thakur said, your place, We're, that's your place. And Guru Maharaj said, oh, I could understand. He was engaged in Ruchi Pariksha, examining the real spiritual taste of the disciple. And Guru Maharaj pointed out at that time, he said, yes, in time, jnana karma dhyanavritam, the layers of jnana and karma covering the soul, they start to uh, fade, diminish, and the swarup starts to reveal itself. So, um, we will say in this regard then, that spiritually speaking, the mind and heart uh, shall be one. Right? And as I mentioned in the beginning, Srimati Radharani says, not only that, but Anyara Hridoyaman Moraman Brindavan. He says, in my mind, and taking it that the mind and heart are one, is synonymous with Vrindavan itself. So in this way we can understand Vrindavan as a construct of the heart of Srimati Radharani, of her serving tendency. 
These different spiritual planes are identified and qualified according to uh, depth of dedication. We're accustomed to think of uh, planets, stars in space and, and distance in terms of miles, uh, kilometers, light years. There's some system of measurement. But the system of measurement uh, for the spiritual planets, the spiritual domains, is a degree of dedication. That is what distinguishes uh, the lower hemisphere of the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, from the upper hemisphere, the Adhoksaja, uh, the Aprakrita uh, plane of Goloka Vrindavan. And Rupa Goswami addresses this in the uh, Upadeshamritam. In the slogan, it says, Vaikuntaj Janito Bara Madhupuri Tatrapi Rasotsavad. He's saying there why Mathura is superior to Vaikuntha. Sometimes Guru Maharaj describes it. He said, where Sanatan Goswami goes step by step by step in uh, gradual development of Brihad Bhagavatamritam. So Rupa Goswami leaps from Vaikuntha to Mathura, bypassing Ayodhya along the way. And he says, why is Mathura superior to Vaikuntha? Vaikuntha's Janito Bara Madhupuri, because of the birth pastimes. The Vaikuntha world is qualified and characterized as two and a half rasas. Shantarasa, Dasya, and in the case of some old time servitors, the beginning of uh, Sakyarasa, some friendship. Whereas normally we'll take it the beginning of um, parental, Vatsalya Rasa is in Ayodhya, and the introduction of conjugal seva to Sita. But beyond that, uh, it's extended to the 18,000, 16,108 queens in Dwaraka. And Parakya Rasa is introduced in Vrindavan. But uh, I once asked Srila Gurumar, just thinking about these things, I said, then there must be a difference between a blade of grass in Vaikuntha and a blade of grass in Vrindavan. And we'll think, well, they're both Shantarasa. But if I'm following what you're saying, then some, their mood of devotion would be different. And Guru Maharaj's response was, of course. <laughs> and uh, he explained the principle that in Vrindavan, although we'll take it, there's Shantarasa, the trees, the grass, Jamuna, cows, birds, bumblebees, peacocks, and then uh, the friends, the Gopabalaks, the gopis, uh, Nanda, Yashoda, the elderly gopis, the gopis who uh, breastfed Krishna as their child for a year, some Vatsalya Rasa, uh, and then the Parakya Rasa of the Braja Gopis. Uh, right? Srila Gurudev was once explaining something along these lines, and he's mentioned, it's in the book called Religion of the Heart. Speaking of the heart, religion of the heart. And there he mentions that the impetuousness of Krishna. Sometimes we know Mother Yasoda's tending to milk or she's cooking something or whatever, and Krishna wants her attention and he wants it now. And he wants her to stop everything that she's doing and attend to his, endire, his wants and desires immediately. 
So discussing this, Srila Gurudev said, this is uh, 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 parakya rasa, right? parakya bhav. So it was published in the book originally, something along the lines of someone pointed out, it seemed to be indicating paramore relationship between Yashoda and Krishna. How is that possible? This must be incorrect. It should be, uh, you know, some improper uh, siddhanta has been given. Uh, and, but if we look carefully, that was not what was being said. What Srila Gurudev was pointing out, this impetuous mood of Krishna was indicative of parakya bhav. And we say parakya, it means the sense of another. So Srila Guru Maharaj has explained in Goloka Vrindavan that parakya is the predominating sentiment. Uh, the cowherd boys, they hear rumors that, that Gopal is not one of us, or they're thinking that themselves. He does extraordinary things. Uh, I think some people say Gopal is not one of us. That makes them nervous. And the outcome is it makes them uh, express a greater depth of love in the uh, being confronted with his otherness. Right? Mother Yashoda will say, she will hear rumors that Krishna is not her son. That some people say he's the son of uh, Vasudev and Devaki and that he was transferred from Mathura to here. Right? She doesn't like to hear that. Again, that is parakya bhav, the sense that Krishna is, belongs to another. And what is the end result? A greater flow of love and affection from the heart of Yasoda. So, uh, also the cowherd men, when Krishna, uh, particularly after the Govardhan Leela, where he lifted Govardhan Hill for seven days on the pinky of his left hand, we're told by Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur that during that period, everyone was so charmed by Krishna's sweetness that they didn't notice his uh, majestic aspect, his divinity. That's something extraordinary because we would think they're seeing, he's holding Govardhan Hill, isn't it obvious? But as we were speaking of the other day, the magnitude of Krishna's beauty and sweetness is so great. They were so charmed by it that they didn't notice the, uh, th that this was something miraculous and extraordinary, beyond human, Godlike, etc. But after he placed Govardhan, replaced Govardhan and, uh, where it was previously, and we're told at that time, every, first of all, before he did, a few things noteworthy are that the animals that were on the top, when he held it, the cloud, they were above the clouds. So they didn't get rained on her. They were all happily on top of the mountain. Plane. Then everyone who came underneath were being protected. Then at a particular point, Krishna said, now cowherd men, elderly gopis, you can return. They got in their <coughs> wagons with their cows and they left and Krishna replaced Govardhan Hill. Then at that time, talk came, rumors came, where they're thinking, <clears throat> Putana, Rakshasi came, uh, Trinavarta, uh, Shakatasura, uh, when Krishna, when Mother Shoda bound Damodar Krishna and he pulled the grinding mortar and the 
Yamal Arjuna, the twin Arjuna trees, the gods came out. Uh, Kalia, who they felt was really um, a formidable foe, how easily Krishna dealt with Kalia, dancing on the heads of Kalia. Then this end. So they thought of all these different extraordinary uh, events, miraculous uh, manifestations. And they approached Nanda Maharaj saying, we think that Gopal is not an ordinary child. He's some kind of God. The Nanda Maharaj to placate everyone, to appease them, told them of the name-giving ceremony when Gargarishi was summoned to do the horoscope, the astrological calculation for Krishna, and at that time give his name. And he mentioned that um, he will save you all from calamity. He's like Narayan, which is sort of a cryptic remark. So Nanda Maharaj told them, really what the situation is, Gargamuni told me that in my past life I was very pious and this boy, he appears at different, as different incarnations at different times. So you can understand there's the presence of Narayan within him. And therefore we're being repeatedly saved uh, from inauspiciousness. So it's not that he's God, it's not that he's an ordinary human, but uh, understand things in this way, that um, I'm blessed to have such a wonderful child. And because they're simple-hearted uh, cowherd men, they, um, they accept this. For them, it's some sort of an adjustment. And they also, upon reflection, thought, uh, even though Gopal shows so many extraordinary, uh, miraculous feats, still, he shows so much love and affection for us that if we neglect him, he becomes morose. Uh, he, he comes and talks to us all the time, so many ordinary things even nonsense things. He has so much love and affection for us, we have so much love and affection for him. So, uh, sometimes in their hearts, momentarily the Aishwarjagyan, the knowledge of Krishna's divinity appears, but the flow of heart, their Raga Bhakti is so great that it becomes uh, subdued. Just as Yashoda, when we hear uh, that uh, Krishna, there's a complaint against Krishna from Balaram and the other cowherd boys that he's been eating earth. Right? Uh, so, uh, this is an example of how his lying is liberating. Right? Once Srila Guru Maharaj said, describing Krishna, he said, autocrat, despot, and liar. And everyone was shocked. He goes, that, that's a very unconventional way to praise the Lord. <laughs> My dear Lord, you are an autocrat, despot, and liar. Amen. <laughs> they said, autocrat, despot, and liar. And one devotee said, could you please explain that? And he said, yes, autocrat, reality is for itself and by itself. The Hegelian maxim, swarat, he exists to fulfill his own purpose. 
He's not contingent, his existence is not contingent upon any other. He's the absolute. Then, uh, despot. He said, yes, because if we try to impose our moral standards upon him, then we become losers. He's the absolute good, the ultimate and absolute good. We shouldn't try to check his movements by imposing the boundaries, limitations, constraints of human standards. This is part of the mystery, mystery of Prakritalila, uh, human-like pastimes. So he's an autocrat, despot. Okay, then we can understand reality for itself, by itself. Nothing should come to check him. He's the absolute good. Uh, but liar? How, how do we harmonize that? How shall we digest that? The Roman said, yes, liar. Because you're not ready to hear the truth. <laughs> he said, so he's adopted the position of a liar to gradually give you exposure to the truth. Uh, similar is that to the saying appears in the Bhagavatam, Paroksha Bhada Bedo Yam Balanam Anushashanam. The way you teach a child is not to fully reveal the truth, but to gradually reveal the truth. So on this liar, lying, Krishna's lying being liberating, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Tagore gives us an example. When Yashoda calls Krishna and said, have you been eating earth? And Krishna said, no, I haven't. Uh, the other boys, we were playing and they're angry at me and they want to get me in trouble with you. So they're saying that I've eaten earth but I've not eaten any earth. You can look in my mouth and see what a good boy I am. And mother said, then she looks, Krishna opens his mouth and what does she, he, he see inside her mouth? The earth planet. I've not eaten any earth. Look, she says, the earth. What to speak of some earth, she sees the earth. And as she looks closer, she sees all the planets, all the stars, the Milky Way, the galaxies, so many. And she becomes overwhelmed. And she thinks momentarily, the Aiswarjagan appears in her heart and consciousness and she thinks, it's by the influence of yoga maya that I'm thinking he's my child. He's the supreme, original personality of Godhead. But under the influence of this divine illusion, I think he's my child, he treats me as mother, like that. Then, sometimes Guru Maharaj said, then a cat nearby goes, meow! And Krishna is afraid and he grabs his mother's sari and holding on to her because he's afraid. And she's thinking, that's my boy. All that Aiswarj again, that momentary awareness of Krishna's divinity vanishes like a hallucination. Right? Like so many thoughts go through, and momentarily this went through, my, vanished. Right? So, and Chakravarti Thakur makes some distinction. After Krishna killed Kangsa, uh, the, not, the inhabitants of Vrindavan, like Nanda Marjana, they're all embracing Krishna and celebrating. Vasudeva and Devaki were more reserved because they were aware of his divinity. So, he lied to his mother and she became, well, we don't take it that she was conditioned to begin with, but it's that lying is liberating and good. It liberate, to hear about it, we'll say this, if the non-liberated 
hear about Krishna's lying to his mother, they will become liberated. Uh, Yashoda's position is way beyond. I was once discussing with Srila Guru Maharaj, and he's talking about Yashoda. And someone mentioned the servitor, the uh, Raktak and Patrak, mentioned by Rufa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and we take their, aspire to have the dust of their feet upon our heads. But in this particular context, someone introduced this and Guru said, Ruk, tuk, put, truck, nothing. <laughs> Yashoda. He's talking about Mother Yashoda. And then, uh, uh, as he once said, uh, uh, well, I'll say this. Then I, I said, oh, what about in Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, Manmana, Baba Mad Bhakto, Madjajimam, Namaskuru. Think, always think of me, become my devotee. And then as much as Guru Maharaj was talking about Yashoda, he said, we left that a long time ago. <laughs> like, you're not paying attention. I'm like, what about Man Manab? We left that a long time ago. Learn to think of me. Become my devotee. You think that applies to Yashoda? Right? Krishna's sitting on her lap, sucking her breast. Right? She's singing you know, songs of his pastimes. She's the Holy Mother of God. Right? So when some devotees hearing, partially hearing analysis about Shantarasya, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, Madhura, uh, Swakya, Bharakya, somehow invoking Guru Maharaj's name, they were demeaning Vatsalya Rasa. When the news of this came to Guru Maharaj's ear, he said, my heart is mortified to hear this. He said, what do they think it is? He said, and don't they know? He said, the first duty every morning of Radharani and Braja Gopis when they rise in the morning is they go to the doorstep of Yashoda and give their dandavats and thank the Lord for Yashoda whom without which there would be no Krishna. <clears throat> so Yashoda va Mahabhaga Nandakim Akarod Brahmam Shreya Evam Mahodayam. Then Purikit Maharaj and Sukadev were praising Nanda Maharaj. Ahangiha Nandam Bande Yashalande Param Brahma, Krishna's ca- crawling in his courtyard. It says Yashoda Ma, Ma- Yashoda Va- Mahabhaga. She's even more fortunate than Nanda Maharaj. Papo yasya stanam hari, because Krishna is sitting on her lap sucking her breast milk. Nandakim akarod brahman, what did they do to achieve these positions? Mm-hmm. At the end, of the Upadesh Amritam, some advice is given about bathing in the waters of Radha Kunda. Srila Guru Maharaj quotes Saraswati Thakur saying, that is not water in the conventional sense. To bathe in the waters of Radha Kunda means to bathe in the waters of a particular level of Atmani Vedana, of uh, dedication and self-sacrifice. One should bathe in those waters of self-giving to the extreme. That is why it is qualified as Radha Kunda. Vrindavana Hoyte Shreshta Govardhana Shoyla Gandharvika Giri Dhari Jata Kridda Koyla why Govardhan is superior to Vrindavan, Radha Kunda to Govardhan, then Radha Kunda 
Saraswati Thakur explained once, the bank of Radhakunda and the waters of Radhakunda. Gradation, gradation, gradation. Higher, finer, more refined. So to bathe in those waters means in a particular level of uh, self-giving and self-sacrifice. So sometimes Srila Guru Maharaj would say, 24 hours engagement in Krishna consciousness to the extreme is only possible in Madhura Rasa. Mahatmanas to Mamparta Daivim Prakriti Masrita Bhajan Twananya Manaso Gyatva Bhuti Radhim Avyayam no, that's not it. But anyway. <clears throat> hey, Krishna. Any other question? Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. What did he ask? <laughs> Krishna only wants love and affection, right? whether it's from Chinese, American, Russian, Indian. His, in, his, we're, this theme about heart. Krishna consciousness is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. So only the, the body, there's a Chinese body, a Thai body, American body, but there's not a Chinese soul, American soul, Thai soul, Indian soul. But you have to explain to him something about karma and desire. So he was in China, now he's in Thailand. Why? There's some reason for that, right? There's some reason. We, we are the, uh, uh, we generate our karmic circumstances. So when mother and father meet, their consciousness attracts particular soul to take shelter in the womb of that mother. So it has to do with uh, karmic destiny. We say for every action, equal and opposite reaction. So there's some action in the past that necessitated that someone's born in China, someone's born in Thailand, someone's born in America, someone's born in Russia. But the important thing to understand is the heart-to-heart -heart connection from the heart of Krishna to the heart of the devotee. And that transcends uh, geography, politics, geopolitical, socio-economic uh, circumstances. <clears throat> But the simplest answer is that they wanted to. Those people wanted that, and Krishna 
fulfill their desire. <laughs> so we should be careful what we ask for. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Yes. I have a question from Moscow to Pandit. <laughs> All right. The other one is in Chitana Charitamrita, and the question arises, but the tradition of Keshe Vakashmiri, was he a prophet of Chaitanya of the day or not? And uh, is there any mention about him or God? You know, that's the question. I don't know. But for someone to participate on that level in the pastimes of Mahaprabhu, it cannot be a man from the street. So we're told by reputation, he was uh, you know, reputed to be the favorite son of the goddess Saraswati. And the fact that on the bank of the Ganga, he could compose spontaneously 100 slokas shows some sort of extraordinary uh, capacity, qualifications. And I don't know if there were more mistakes, but Mahaprabhu only pointed out a mistake in a particular sloka. Nimai Pandit, and I forget the number of which one, it was somewhere in the middle, in the high 50s or something. And that's why Keshava Kazmiri was, he said, I was astonished that I could compose them, and he, rem he now has memorized all of them, and not only knows all of them, but he's pointing out a flaw in one of them, and it's a very subtle, subtle intricate sort of thing. So then he could understand who is this Nimai Pandit who's at the time just a young teacher and not a teacher of advanced students, a teacher of the beginning level. That's the beauty of a Prakrita Leela disguised in the middle position. So he's teaching the the lower level. So that means he should not, he should be the least qualified. Uh, but we understand the case of a Kashmiri, he becomes a great devotee after that. But the details of who he may have been previously, I don't recall that being expressed. Hare <clears throat> Krishna. Yes. What we find in the poetry of Rupa Goswami, uh, Sloka Gurudev loved very much, was it Sakki, Murali, Chida, Jalena Purna, 
Lagu, you know, Grantila, right? Nira Shashi, Chumbanananda. I forget the sloka at present. I'm, it's written by, composed by Rupa Goswami, who is Rupa Manjari and Vrindavan. And it is, comes from the mouth of Chandravali, who is Srimati Radharani's um, principal competitor. And Chandravali is saying in this sloka, uh, she's expressing some jealousy of the flute of Krishna. This is also mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam. So she's saying, <laughs> and it, again, it's in the Bhagavatam and somewhere between, expressed by other gopis, they're also expressing, we'll use the word jealousy, and she's expressing it here and saying, who is this flute? What is this flute? Where did he come from? And what is he doing, situating himself at the lips of Krishna? They're saying, we, we're Braja gopis. So you have, there's Gopa and Gopis. Krishna is Gopal. He's a Gopa. Then naturally he should be connected with Gopis. When the wives of the Brahmins uh, uh, were offering themselves to Krishna, they understood that that was socially awkward because they thought, oh, we're Brahmins' wives, you're a cowherd. <laughs> like once... Uh, when Radharani's girlfriends, they're trying to save her from Krishna. They're telling her, like, how could you be so foolish to fall for a cowherd? Like, we could understand if it was some very high, high society person. But a cowherd, you've fallen madly in love with a cowherd. Right? Why? A Prakrita Leela, you know, Shudra. Vaisha, Chatriya, Brahman, in the middle position. It's always hidden in the middle. Right? So, and those cowherd men I mentioned earlier too, they told Vasudev, uh, this is so strange because avatars don't usually appear you know, in families of low class people like us. I mean, it gives you some idea of the kind of level of thinking they have. Avatars is just a given, assumed. And they're thinking, well, avatars, when they normally appear, you know, higher part of society, what's an avatar doing in a cowherd community? That doesn't make any sense. So you're probably right. He's not God. <laughs> it's a very beautiful way of thinking. Jnana Shunya Bhakti. As Guru Maharaj said, Krishna likes to surround himself with ignorant people. <laughs> but their ignorance is the highest type of jnana uh, dipena bhajra, of understanding. So the gopis, Chandravali, are saying, this flute, gopa meant for gopis, gopal meant for gopis, he's a boy. This flute is a boy. What is he doing with Krishna? This isn't right. And they're saying, and that flute, Nira Shashi, he's a dry piece of wood. He has nothing to offer. He's a piece of, and knots, chidra means knots or holes. Can also mean uh, flaws, faults. As they're masters of the double entendre, insult. So they're saying, full of flaws, full of holes. A, a flute has many holes? They're saying, full of many flaws. So he's male, full of faults, juiceless, no rasa. And this flute is at the lips of Krishna where this stream of nectar is issuing forth. 
what is meant for us is being intercepted by the flute. So she's saying, I can't tolerate this. <laughs> so this is, if you can understand this type of jealousy, you won't have to take birth in this world again. Janma karma dame chame divyam evam yo veti tattvataha Chaktva deham Chaktva deham punar janma naiti maam eti sorjana Everything can ha trace back to the central conception of the Absolute, the Aprakrita Leela of Krishna. Janmad yasya yataha ari rasa mukya rasa and more specifically, parakya is the origi origin of everything. So everything can be accommodated there, including jealousy. But not envy of the devotee, matsarja, right? not envy of a devotee for their devotion. Not denying their uh, good fortune. Chandrava and the others, they're indirectly, they're singing the glories of the flute. They're acknowledging the flute's intimate position, it's the eternal paraphernalia of Krishna. Right? As we hear in the Brahma Sangita, in the con very conclusion. Shreya Kanta Kanta Sloka. Yatha Ganam Yat Gamanam Kanam Gamanam Bhangshi Priya Saki. We're all uh, Kata speaking is song and Gata movement is dance and Krishna's forever holding has dear Bhangshi uh, flute pressed to his lips. So, uh, it depends on the quality of the heart. So here, there, we can call it jealousy, but it's not heart-destroying, uh, denying the devotion of others, but rather acknowledging their good fortune and uh, envying their position, wanting to be like them, not dismissing them. We told some of Gurudev's final words where he said, everyone has some fault, big or small. He said, that is not the question. He said, but those who have devotional spirit, that must be uh, acknowledged and respected. So if the end result is the devotee is thinking, why can't I be like that? If the end result is increased dedication, then it's something uh, spiritual in character. If the end result is uh, that one is moving away from the plane of dedication, diminished appreciation for devotees and devotion, then it is... Uh, um, a disease, it's cancerous. The word lolium is used in one place as being uh, uh, a fault, an unde uh, undesirable trait and characteristic, and another place being told as the uh, price to pay. Right? Nupidesh Amrita, you know what is it? Dadati Patrikrinati, no, not that, what is it? Uh, 
Prajalpa Niyama Graha Jana Sanghas Chaloyam Cha. What is the beginning? Anyone know that sloka? From the Upadesha Amritam? Atyahara Prayasis Cha Prajapa Niyamagraha Jana Sanghas Chaloyam Cha Sadbir Bhaktir Vinashati. These are the things that destroy devotion. One of them mentioned lolyam, desire, hankering. Right. Out of control. Then we're told Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavitamati, Kriyatam Yuti Kutopina Lajate, Tatra Lolyam Mulam Ekalam. Here we're told, but lolyam, this is. Uh, what you have to have to get this, then. what does that mean? Genuine hankering for that divine substance. You can use the word greed. So in one place, greed is bad. In another place, greed is good. Atmindya priti ichadari prema, Atmindya priti ichadari kam, Krishnindya priti ichadari Bole, Atmindriya uh, Priti Ichadari Bole Kam, Krishnendriya Priti Ichadari Premanam. Atmindriya, when it's self directed toward that misconceived self, then we're told it's calm, lust, degrading. When it's Krishnendriya, Krishikena, Krishikesha Sevanam, in the service of Krishna, the same thing is, goes by the name of Prem. It's uh, invigorating, enlivening. So the jealousy expressed by the Brajagopis is a very sweet and wonderful thing. In many places they do. When Krishna abandons them, in the forest of Vrindavan at the beginning of the Rasalila, and he goes off with Srimati Radharani in search for her. And they're there, left to their fate and fortune. They're praising the deer. They envy the deer. They're saying, Deer, with the husband and wife, you're both devotees of Krishna. Husband and wife, both targeting Krishna, can both together go and serve Krishna. We're not so fortunate. Our husbands don't want us to be here. They're trying to obstruct our path to Krishna. They're inquiring from the creepers, the vines. They're seeing the fortune of all others, not themselves. Right? That's the, their type of so-called jealousy to recognize the good fortune of others, not to try and prevent or dismiss the good fortune of others, but to recognize that. They think, oh, the cowherd boys, they get to go to the forest with Krishna, and we ha we we're not allowed. How fortunate they are. Wish we could be like them. So Srila Prabhupada used to use this expression, transcendental competition. And uh, Guru Maharaj later uh, paraphrased that as a competition of dedication. So if observing the devotional qualities and characteristics of another devotee either uh, in this realm or through the eyes of the scripture, that, that may awaken within us some uh, appreciation and hankering that we could also be like that someday. They're showing that it's possible. Right? Samasrataye parapalava pavam mahatpatum yon 
Punya Yaso Murari, Babam Budhir Vatsa, Param Padam Padam, Param Padam Yad Vipadam Natesham. Gurumars compared the Vaishnavas to lighthouses illuminating the way across the ocean of Neshans. And the Bhagavatam says, the path chalked out by their lotus feet, that remains a path of approach. Just as in this world, if someone, there's some forest or woods, someone will make a path. Uh, and we'll see, if you look carefully, you see, oh, you follow this path and you'll get to the other side. So the devotees are, um, by their example, uh, by their uh, heart's devotional expression, creating a path to the lotus feet of Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Sri Gurudev.